You know, we're discussing backstage, did any of you go to sleep or you're here from the Marshall Tucker Gym? <laughs> anyway, uh, for those who do not know me, my name is Sal Serencioni. I'm with Premier Radio Networks based out of New York. I conducted the Q&A on deck the other day with the Doobies, Don Felder, Dave Mason. We did one with Lonnie Jordan and Rick Emmett. And this morning we're going to wrap it up with uh, arguably two legends. Um, so it's not about me, it's about you guys. I've got a lot of your questions. I've got some questions of my own, and we're ready to go. So, let me bring out Alice Cooper and Paul Rogers. So these are all the people that didn't stay all, up all night with... Uh... Marshall Tucker, right? Yes, he did! That one, sort of, yeah. I'll be able to tell by the slurs. So, well, uh, thank you both for getting up early to do this. I know this is not usually on the um, singer rock artist schedule to be uh, doing interviews at 10 in the morning, but I appreciate I'm, I'm it. I'm usually on the tee this early. <laughs> so how's it been going, Paul? This is your second cruise, the Rock Legends cruise. Alice, is this your first? First, so? Yeah. Good experience? I'm liking it, yeah. It's amazing. It's, it's finally rock. warm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been fun, you know. I mean, first of all, you have to remember that when we get on these cruises, like, Paul and I know each other for years and years and years, and when we do these or when we do festivals in Europe, it's like a fraternity. You know, you, you see all these guys. Who are we playing with tonight? Oh, we're playing with... You know, Paul Rogers, and we're playing with uh, these guys and those guys. And you haven't seen them in years, so it's kind of like an old, you know, fraternity thing. So it's great to see them again. We did a, a, we did a thing called the um, British Rock Symphony, Symphony, where it was like... Australia. Australia. Oh, it was pretty, pretty amazing. It was Daltrey and me and you and yeah, Frampton. Yeah. And did a lot of the Beatles stuff. Yeah. And, and with an orchestra, which was very, very interesting to have all, all that together. Well, well, it was it was nice actually because we got to spend a little time together. We we uh, Australia is such a vast country; you generally fly everywhere. But a couple of the trips we took um, we took the van together. Yeah. And Alice, it was really interesting. You were telling me some stories about when you met Elvis, and yeah, <laughs> and that was a great story. I don't know if you want to share that with us. Well, <laughs> the, the Elvis story was great because it was when Elvis was Elvis, you know. 1971, when he, when he walked in the room, he was the room. Yes. You know what I mean? Black leather. Uh, I get this call, you know, do you want to meet Elvis? I went, yeah. Like, yeah. And, you know, and I get to the elevator at the Hilton, and it's Liza Minnelli, Chubby Checker, Linda Lovelace, and me. <laughs> now. The original Motley crew. Yes. <laughs> Three of us left that night, one stayed. I don't know what Elvis and Chubby Checker did all night, but... <laughs> the twist. <laughs> so we, we get up there, and they check you for guns, which is kind of silly, because there's guns everywhere once you get in. You know, Elvis always had guns around. And uh, we're standing there, and all of a sudden, he walks in the room, you know. And it's like, hey, man, hey, man you're, the, you're the cat with the snake, ain't you? Yeah. yeah. Make up the snake and all this stuff. I dig that, man. I dig that. It's cool. He says, uh, so come on in here. I want to show you something. So we go in the kitchen, you know, and he opens the drawer, takes out a loaded 38 Smith & Wesson snub nose, hand, puts it in my hand. He says, I'm going to show you how to take a gun out of somebody's hand. <laughs> Little devil on my shoulder says, kill him. <laughs> And for a second I went, wow, that would be something. That would be the biggest rock news of all time. <laughs> and then the little angel finally, you know, goes, wound him. <laughs> Don't kill him. Just wound him. By the time I had to decide the gun was over there, I was on the floor, his boots in my throat. Ah, it's good, Elvis. Can I get up now? Yeah. But it was, you know, and I realized that the one thing, he lived in this little world very small world because the colonel would never let him out of that world. He had all these guys around him and he could have anything he wanted in a room about this size, let's say. And he realized that 
if you are confined on any level, you're gonna find a way to kill yourself. I don't care if it's eating, drugs, guns, women, something. You're gonna find a way to kill yourself, which he did. He ate himself to death and he, he, he drugged himself to death. Yeah. And same with Michael Jackson. You know, and I always, I said right then in my head, I never want to get that big. Yeah. I don't want to get so big that I can't leave my room. Yeah, I thought the, the nice climax of that story was when you had, he had you down on the floor with his <laughs> boot in your face. And you were going, thank God. Now I'm not going to get shot by a bunch of security guys coming in the room. <laughs> well, the Memphis Mafia is in the other, you know, they're in the other room. And I said, they're going to walk in here and, you know, shoot me full of holes. <laughs> they're going to see Alice Cooper yeah. with a gun pointed at Elvis. <laughs> no, but apparently he does this all the time. So it wasn't like the first time thing. If you would have been there, you would have been <laughs> And but Elvis was great, though. I mean, he was Elvis. He had a great sense of humor. He had a, he had a great deprivate. He, he, could, he could make fun of himself, you know. Yeah, so, yeah. You know, something wrong with my lip, you know. Or something wrong with yeah. Him. Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, my manager went to see him once, and he got a, his autograph for me and brought it back. And on the autograph, it says, take time to live. Wow. Um, and I thought, wow. Actually, I thought, well, what does that mean? You know, Elvis Presley, take time to live. And it was like he was sending out a message to another, you know, a, a would-be up-and-coming singer to say, take time to live, because maybe he hadn't done, you know. Yes, I, he, yeah. he was totally under control of the, of the, uh, the colonel. Yeah, and The yeah. colonel was not a great guy. It was, he nah. was probably a good manager, but not a great guy. Yeah. Yeah, he, he says, do you want to see my most prized possession? This is what really got me. And I said, sure. So... He said, come on in here. We go in the bedroom, he closes the door. Now I'm in a bedroom with Elvis. <laughs> and I'm going. What's the devil minute. saying now? Wait a minute. If, <laughs> if Rock Hudson, I got fooled by Rock Hudson, you know. And so all of a sudden he pulls out this envelope, takes it out, and it's a bunch of x-rays. <clears throat> and he says, what happened here was, uh, so I was coming out of the, the Hilton in the back parking lot here, and these three drunk boys wanted to fight me. He says, and so I called my boys off, and I fought all three of them. You know, because he was, was a karate guy. He was like, he says, I broke this guy's shin right here. He said, and I swung around and hit this guy. And he had the x-rays <laughs> of these guys. Of the victims. And this was his connection to the outside world with these x-rays. And that's right then when I went, uh-oh. <laughs> so this guy is really already... <laughs> swirling out of control, you know, and, and that was in 71, so you can imagine, you know, all the stuff that went on after that, but I mean, that, can you imagine, that was his connection to the outside world, was fighting three guys, he probably bought them all Cadillacs yeah. afterwards, <laughs> but he had the x-rays of how he fought them, wow. What about for you, Paul, any uh, heroes of yours that you have had the opportunity to meet or would like to meet, or you know, a situation like Alice, where would you like to meet so-and-so when you were brought up to whether a suite or to a recording studio? I can't match that, actually. I don't think many people have, have met Elvis and pointed a gun at him. Not really, no. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> oh, good. Well, speaking of heroes, <clears throat> heroes to the both of you guys uh, in, in numerous conversations that I've had with the both of you are the Beatles. And about five or six years ago, Paul, you and I, we um, you did the KLOS radio Christmas show in Los Angeles. And uh, we, were, oh. <clears throat> we were talking backstage, and you uh, said you just had come uh, the day before or so from recording a track for a Paul McCartney tribute album. So, of course, being the news reporter that I am, my years went up. I said, well, what did you do? He goes, I, let, let me roll it. And you were the only person to have said anything about that tribute album until this past fall when it finally came out. It is called The Art of McCartney, and mm -hmm. you also are on this album. Yeah. And you have described yourself in seeing Paul McCartney in concert as a 16-year-old girl at the foot of the stage That's screaming. Right. You've told me that before. <laughs> they started with, I saw her standing there. Yeah. I had no control. I'm with you, man. <laughs> <laughs> You know, because that when I was 16, they affected me that much. The Beatles affected me, me too. that much. Yeah, yeah, those songs really, really, they did it for me. And they still do, actually. Still yeah, yeah, they still do. Well, for many people in the United States, the first introduction was, was uh, the Ed Sullivan show. What about for you in England, Paul? When did you first become aware of them? 
Well, the Beatles, actually, the first time I saw the Beatles was before, was when they released Love Me Do, and they were on a, a program in England, um, and they, they, it wasn't really a major hit. I think it reached number 12 or something in the charts. But it was something about them, even then, straight away, I thought, wow, these guys are cool, you know. Love, love me do. And then, and then Lennon plays that, that harmonica. Wah, 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 ba -da. Then he does that, that Lennon grin. And I thought they were great right from the start. And was it, was it indeed the Ed Sullivan show for you? I was painting my house. I was 15 years old, 16 years old, painting the house, and the radio was always on. And we were fans of the Beach Boys, the Four Seasons, those were our bands, you know. And all of a sudden, I heard, da -dum, da -dum, she loves you, yeah, yeah. And I went. <laughs> I said, what was that? Yeah. An hour later, I heard, please, please me, oh yeah. yeah. And I went, what? It was like an invasion. It was like something I'd never heard before. It was all brand new. It had energy. It was up. It so was much joy is in oh, the music too, and that the harmonies. And then every single song was better than the last one. You know, and you just, you'd never heard that before. We used to have these little top 40 charts. You remember those, you know, at your KRIZ, KRUX top 40. And you always check to see how your, your favorite song was doing on that. And I picked it up, and the top 10 are all Beatles songs. And I went, good. This changes everything, you know. And uh, I think right then is when I went, I don't really want to work in a gas station. <laughs> Not really mentally prepared for that. I could do this, you know. <laughs> I'd hate to think what the devil on your shoulder would tell you to do at a gas station. <laughs> Either of you ever seen him in concert? The Beatles. I never saw the Beatles. No, I never saw them live, but I did play at the Cavern once, and I was amazed, actually, years, years later, at the size of the stage. I mean, the size of the stage is like that. I mean, it's from here to there to that speaker. It's a tiny little stage. And, um, and to stand on it, where really the hair stand on the back of your neck, because you think, wow, from this place, in this cavern, it's really just a, a, an old wine cellar from the way old days, they went out and they changed the world. You know. Well, and you have to remember the bands like Paul, myself, the Beatles, I don't care who it is, all started as cover bands. I mean, every yeah, one of much. us started out yeah. doing 70% of our material, 80% yeah. was covers. Mm -hmm. So we learned the Beatles, that's how you learned Chuck Berry first, was yeah. probably 101. Uh, then you learned the Beatles, the Stones, the Kinks, the Yardbirds, all these bands were our education. That's how we learned how to play. We had no idea that the Rolling Stones were selling us back our own music. I thought the Stones wrote all those songs. And then I started looking at them and I said, who's Willie Dixon? You know, who's, and I realized that all these guys were all the, the old blues guys. Started and, an education. Yeah, but it was, but that's how we learned how to play. You never think of the Beatles as being a cover band, but almost all their songs, Diz, uh, uh, Dizzy Miss Lizzy, uh, Roll Over Beethoven, all that stuff. They did a lot of Chuck Berry. Same with the Stones. A lot of Chuck Berry. He was he was sort of the the real rock and roll architect. Yeah, Mr. Postman, Twist and Shout. They did all those stuff. They, they sort of, um, they percolated in Germany, really, didn't yeah, they? They, yeah. they were there in, in, in Hamburg and Frankfurt. That was right. Yeah. And um, they slept in a cinema behind the screen with the, the movies still going on. And... Uh, that's nice amazing to think about, yeah. but we, you know, everybody has humble beginnings when it, when it comes to rock and roll. Yeah, well, exactly. And I'd be quite a thrill to be asked to be part of that tribute album, though, Art of McCartney and you doing Let Me Roll It. Was that your d uh, choice? Or oh, yeah, yeah. They asked me which song I'd like to do, and I, I said, wow, I I've always loved that song. It's, it's really, it's like a Beatles song, yeah. you know? I mean, I can't tell you how I feel. My heart is like a wheel. Let me roll it. I just thought that was just such a, a really great good song, lyric. Yeah. yeah. Well, I got there and they said, uh, Eleanor Rigby, and I went. <laughs> That's a song you don't mess around with. You know, I mean, you know, you got Mich Michelle yesterday. I figured they were gonna give me like drive my car, you know, or a rocker, you know, slow down or something. And I go, Eleanor Rigby? <laughs> You're talking to me? But uh, it, you know, then you, you had to do it as close as you could. I did it as close as I could to what the way, you know, that they would have done it. And then I got to do Smile Away, which was a little bit more of a rocker for me. 
you know, but Eleanor Rigby took over. And I forgot about, that. it was three years ago, wasn't it? Wasn't it two years ago? A while ago, ago. yeah. Well, yeah, Paul yeah, started doing at least five or six years ago. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so I forgot all about it. I figured, well, they heard my version, threw it out. <laughs> you know? yeah. And the record's going to come out, and I won't be on it, but nobody will know. And then it came out. <laughs> and, you know, it was all, again, all of our friends are on that record. Yeah. Everybody we know is on that record. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's, it's, I mean, it's Billy Joel. For those of you who don't know about this album, real quick, Billy Joel, Bob Dylan, Steve Miller, Brian Wilson, Smokey Robinson, B.B. King. I mean, the list goes on and on. It's all A, a The Bob players. Dylan thing. What, what song did he do? He did something off of Hell. Uh, Things We Said Today, yeah. I think he did, yeah. You say you love me, <laughs> and now I will know. I went. <laughs> That's an interesting take on that. <laughs> yeah. But he's Bob Dylan. He still made it work, right? <laughs> well, he could I, sing the phone book and it would sound good. No, exactly right. Well, I now uh, I have to follow this up with uh, McCartney now. Um, you recorded with him last year. Yeah, yeah. And um, again, just a blurb went out there. Joe Perry, you, John, uh, Johnny Depp was involved, Paul McCartney. Just a blurb, Joe Perry said, recorded with Paul McCartney and Alice Cooper the other day, but really can't say much. So this past December, I get a call to go up to Paul's office, McCartney, to do an interview with him. So I had to find out. And he goes, <laughs> Well, I don't know if I'm supposed to say anything, but he did. <laughs> so, uh, you know, can you tell us any further? He did tell me that uh, you recorded a version of Bad Fingers Come and Get It, which yep. Paul wrote. It is for the Hollywood Vampires project you have coming out, but he mentioned that Johnny Depp was putting together something, so I'm assuming a documentary. Is this something you can talk about? What, what it really is, is uh, we wanted to... to do a tribute to all of our dead drunk friends, you know? And when we started counting up the guys that we used to drink with, they were all dead, you know? And we said, well, let's do an album for Jim Morrison, Jimi Hendrix, uh, John Lennon, Keith, Keith Moon, Moon T-Rex, Harry Nelson, all these guys. And, and we started, Johnny and I uh, just said, well, who, and Joe Perry said, well, I'll be on it, you know? and and. I showed up, I'm sitting there one day, McCartney's at the piano, and I went. And we were looking at each other, all the guys in the band going. You didn't scream like a 16 year old no. girl. And he's sitting there and he's playing, and he says, okay, so you take the high harmony, I'll do this. And I'm going. You know, because honestly, there's, that's the guy. That's not a, that's the Beatle, you know. And he, at the end of the session, he goes, you want me to play bass on this? I said, no, Paul, we have a better bass player than you. <laughs> no. Yeah, I want you to play bass on this. Yeah. And so, this you'll, you'll totally understand this. He goes over and opens up the case. And the bass is in there. The Hofner left-handed bass. And it was like a scene in Indiana Jones. We were, you know, we thought our faces were gonna melt because it had its own light source, you know. <laughs> Johnny Depp and myself and Joe Perry were going. Oh, he goes, it's a piece of wood. You know, he just does. <laughs> but I mean, he, you have to understand one thing about Paul McCartney is he's just a band guy. He, if he were here, he'd be in any band. He would could jump up and play with any band here because he loves being in a band. He just loves, he'd be in a pub band. If he wasn't in the Beatles, he'd be playing in a pub band. It, you know, he just loves to play. And that's what I picked up from him. His music is everything to him. You know, and, and like I said, he's, that's his life, is, is music. So sitting down at the piano with these guys, he'd sit down at the piano with anybody that could play. And that's him. You know, he's one of the most real guys I've ever met in my life. And so that will be part of the album, which... Um, Dedicated to all of our dead drunk friends. That yeah. you've been working on. And, uh, yeah, we, we do four of the songs tonight. And, yeah, you, know, you we did do the it. other night. I know, yeah. it was tremendous. Yeah. And but I mean, we... it's, uh, it'll be out this year. And, uh, okay. I, it's not my album. It's a Hollywood Vampires album. You know, we, we had a drinking club called the Hollywood Vampires. You would have certainly been invited. Oh, way back. Yeah. Good and thing you weren't. It was, it, was at the, it was at the Rainbow Club in LA. <laughs> yeah. 20, you survived. 27? Sorry, time's up. Out. Uh, but it was like a drinking club that everybody went there every single night. Bernie Toppin was there every night. 
uh, Mickey Dolenz was there. It was just the weirdest mix of people, you know. And we would sit there and wait to see what Keith Moon was going to wear. You know, one night he'd be the Queen of England. He'd come in. And one night he'd be Hitler. And one night he came in as a total French maid. Hello. I will dust this place down. Yeah. Well, we'll look forward to that album. And speaking of covering other people's materials, are you familiar, Paul, the album that he put out last year, The Royal Sessions? Yes, we play it. I play it all this, this album yeah. received such tremendous critical praise. The concert that Paul put on, uh, we were fortunate. He did one in New York, uh, one in London at the Albert Hall. Talk a little bit about that now. Now that it's all kind of soaked in, that whole experience for you on doing the Royal Sessions, you know, doing songs like Thank You and I've Been Loving You Too Long, Any Old Way, I Can't Stand the Rain. Now that, you know, it's been out there, and just kind of reflecting back on the whole project. Well, you know, when I was a kid, when I first, we talked about early influences and stuff like that. When I first was listening to music, I discovered Otis Redding, you know, amongst all of the other great people, like a, a range from Muddy Waters through to the Beatles. And Otis Redding was really, uh, very pivotal for me because when I heard his voice, I just thought, wow, that's the way you do it, you know. And I always wanted to, to cover some of those songs. And so the opportunity came for me. Um, my producer, Perry Margolov, called me up and said, look, I'm in Memphis and um, I'm at the Royal Studios and the place is just as it was in the old days and all the session musicians are standing by, do you want to do a couple of tracks? So I just jumped on a plane and went straight down there. We um, we did about, we started off with um, uh, That's How Strong My Love Is. I was really actually quite nervous, you know, because these cats were really the, the, the business, you know, the Reverend Charles Hodges, those, those great musicians. And um, it just went from there, it just kind of, it grew, and I stayed, and we did a whole album, and it was a great experience. And uh, all the proceeds, Listen to this. All the proceeds from the sale of this album are going to the Stax Music Academy in Memphis. I mean, that's just oh, a yeah. generous, wonderful thing to do. You know, that's where it came from. I was, I was so glad we were going to the studio one day, and it's the, the, the Royal Studios is kind of in the ghetto land now, you know. I mean, it's like a, a beacon of light in the middle of this kind of area with all these derelict buildings and things. We're driving there every day from our nice hotel, and we're thinking, wow, we got, we got so much from this music. And here we are, in a way, we're kind of taking again. Yeah. You know, so we, we said, well, what can we do? And we just looked at each other and said, let's just give it all back. And, you know, Stax was, was kind of the obvious place. It's not a, a working studio anymore. It's more of a, a museum, etc. you know. Although they are going to change that, I hear. Yeah. They're going to have a recording studio there. So that's what we did. And, and it's great. We enjoyed doing that. And um, the New York show was filmed for PBS, so for those, uh, you may catch it during one of the pledge months and stuff. Great stuff, really. Uh, but that's like Detroit. Detroit. That's like Detroit, though. You know, Detroit had Motown. Yeah, yeah. And true. Motown, yeah. I mean, Detroit is just, you know, still, that's hometown for me. Oh, yeah. You know? I mean, I love what came out of Detroit. Too. I, I found it was a smoother kind of soul, though, and it, it but was. it was still great. In Memphis, it was really a kind of mom and pop operation. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was... I found it grittier, and I sort of like that. Yeah, you know? and no, probably no overdubbing. It was probably free, you know. Yeah. It was probably just like live in the studio. That's there, right. Well, those stuff. guys taught us how to record, you know, because yeah. we thought, well, how are they doing this? Well, they're just going in the studio, getting a sound, and playing and capturing it live. Yeah. That's what we'll do. Yeah. You know, yeah. it works. That's what the guys in Detroit, I mean, if you went to Detroit in the 70s, it was the same guys yeah. that did all those early recordings, uh, you know. Yeah. Um, and, and they were the they were the rhythm section. Yeah. You went in and that was your rhythm section. And yeah. those guys played on what a hundred records that That's were hits. Unbelievable. You know, and, and, and they're still there probably. Yeah. You know? And you were saying gritty. You were saying how master tapes were actually in the hallway of the studio, right? I mean, yes. Why are you telling me that? Yeah, in the hallway. There's all the 24 tracks, and they're they're quite big. You know, there's quite thick. Just and down. written in sharpie on the yeah. on the edges. You know, Anne Peebles, I can't stand the rain, for instance. Yeah, wow. I'm like, is that the actual master for, for that? Yeah. For, uh, so they said, oh yeah, they, she recorded that, that song here, the whole album. And, and then they stopped and they said, and we played on it. I was like, what? <laughs> can we do that track? You know, they said, yeah. And we did a version. Just the this. fact that they can play it back. <laughs> you know, that they have those machines, yeah. it's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So as I was going through notes prepping for this interview, and I, I stumbled upon the, the fact that the two of you most recent recordings are cover collections, um, the McCartney tribute album, and I stumbled upon this uh, news report a couple of weeks ago, before obviously coming down here, um, a doting grandfather on the Phoenix News. Uh, Alice Cooper here, uh, his son Dash and his wife Morgan just had twin boys, Ryan and Falcon. Falcon and Riot. And then the other day... I had nothing to do with the naming the kids, I swear. And then the other day, I'm uh, walking through the Windjammer, and I run into Paul's wife, Cynthia, and she's got this little tot with her. And I said, well, who's this? And she goes, that's my grandson, Bodie. It's uh, uh, Paul's grandson, obviously, and the son of his son, Steve, who is also performing tonight. So congratulations to you, too. Thank uh, you. Pretty good. Uh, Congratulations, Granddad. Congratulations, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The funny thing is, we decided that we couldn't be Grandma and Granddad. So we took the Hawaiian names because the kids were basically between Phoenix and Hawaii. That's where they grew up. And so we found out that the Hawaiian name for Grandma is Tutu. Okay, well, my wife teaches ballet. So it's perfect. Unfortunately, the grandfather name is Cuckoo. <laughs> so I'm Cuckoo Cooper. And you're Cuckoo Rogers. So. How appropriate, though. <laughs> well, I thought it was a great piece, and uh, you, you got to check it out. It's on, you'll find it on YouTube. The hey, Doting Mick Jagger's a great grandfather. So. He always, sure. always one-up us, doesn't he? He's always right there ahead and of done us. done that, hey? Yeah. That's true, he is. So, so many things to talk about. Um, just received some honors, the two of you. Paul, uh, check, you know... Paul Rogers, in addition to a tremendous solo career, which you all know, and of course we all know Bad Company, Free, The Firm, The Law. Uh, at the recent BMI Awards, that's for Airplay, Radio Airplay, back here in this, in, back up in the States. Um, Five Million Performance Award for All Right Now. Good Lord. Thank you. <laughs> amazing. It, is, it amazes me, actually, it really does. Yeah, it's fantastic because when we were back in the day when we were writing all those songs, we had no idea that, that they have the longevity that they do. And I can't really explain what it is except that maybe it's the simplicity of the songs that people can still identify with. It had great holes in it. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Great songs got a great holes in it where it makes it move. Yeah. It's what you don't play. In That's that right. Song. That's very important. Yeah. Yes. And, but you've got to clear something up for me. When that song came out, they had a hard time getting it played because they thought it said, we got to move before they raise the... Effing rent. rent. Yeah. Okay. It was strange. And what did, what's the real lyrics? Well, actually, you know, what happened there, the BBC, they called up and they said, we want to play this record, but we don't like the language on it. And we said, well, what language? Well, they, the use of the F word. And we, I completely didn't understand what they were talking about. So... We said, there's, there's no language on it at all. And they said, well, you need to prove that to us. So they came down to the studio. We put the 24-track master up, and we took every track down but the vocal. And it said, uh, now, uh, let's move before they raise the parking rate. You see, and they thought it was the effing rent. That was, that's what I did. Did you? Yeah. I never, I couldn't I went, wow. I was like, wow. <laughs> I blush. So, <laughs> but the record was so good you could not play it I mean the record was such a great record that you couldn't not play it so they started bleeping that word oh that's really weird how strange oh they raised the beep rent and, and I went huh? okay. the beeping rent yeah. no the parking rate funnily enough I mean the parking rate's still going up so it's still see no there, here's the thing <laughs> in, in America there's no such thing as a parking rate uh, oh, so business? that's why nobody understood what that meant. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah. There is in New York. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is. There's a New Yorker. Yeah. And uh, for you, Grammy Hall of Fame, school's out. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> we had no idea that that was going to be the national anthem. You know? uh, it's just one of those songs, you know, I think every, everybody has one song that they'll be associated with forever. I don't care how many songs, great songs, the Stones write, Satisfaction will always be the Stones song. You know, School's Out will always be my song. My Generation will always be the Who song. You know what I mean? I think that last one, 
will always be your song because that wow. was just the. I never thought of it like that. Yeah, but, but that's right. that's the one song that gets associated with you, and uh, and on that song, we were trying to as hard as we could to be the Yardbirds on that song. Bob Ezrin wouldn't let us, but if you notice that at the end, there's that dun 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 dun, dun oh, that yes. bolero thing going on. It's pure Yardbirds. <laughs> yeah, the Yardbirds. I saw them very in the very early days in a place called Stockton, very close to my hometown in Middlesbrough. And they had this weird thing where, and no other band has done it before or since, where everyone hit the downstroke and they went for it. It's sort of like dun dun dun, dun they went dun 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 dun. The rave up. And they went, yeah, they would really build it. The rave up. That was the yeah, an album called it. Rave Up. Uh -huh. And they would do that in almost every song where they would get to the yeah. 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 And it was like it was like winding up a spring and letting it go. You know. Really what other band had Jeff Beck, Jimmy Page, and Eric Clapton as their lead guitar players? Yeah. It's not too bad. Awesome. Pretty good. If you're gonna have a guitar player, you might as well have one of those guys, you know. How about having all three of them in the band? And their songs were so different from anybody else's. I mean, you know, all of their hits were not like the Rolling Stones, they were not like the Kinks, were not like the Hollies. It was had its own sort of futuristic sound to it. Very much so, yeah. yeah. Well, well, on the Arms tour, we did a thing called the Arms tour, and you had, you had those three guys together on stage for really the first time. Wow. Because they, they kind of... They, can I say this, they, they sort of did compete with each other. I mean, they're good, they're brothers in arms and all the rest of it, but there was a sense of competition there. And they, they wouldn't play together on stage. They were a bit sort of like, well, I'm not playing with him. <laughs> and a bit like that. So yeah, actually, they on the arms tour, they did get on stage together. And it was, that was unbelievable. Yeah. Well, there was one record that Beck and Page played on. It was on Happenings 10 Years Time Ago, where they both played lead on it. And I think at that point, they realized there were too many chefs. All three you know, in one in one room. Uh, but I, I did an interview with Jeff Beck for my radio show. And I said, Jeff, this is the way I look at it. Eric Clapton, probably the best blues rock guitar player. Jimmy Page, probably the best rock and roll guitar player. Jeff Beck, probably the best guitar player. And he went, I'll go with that. I'll go with that, for sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, as I mentioned, I had, uh, do, do we call you guys do we call ourselves cruisers? I don't know, is that the proper term? But I had the fans here uh, send in a whole bunch of questions and I've been going over them the last few We've weeks. We've already said no math, okay. So, no, no math. But this question actually didn't come in via email. It came in, I was stopped the other day by a young lady right over there. Her name is Kathy, she's from Orlando. Alice, this is for you. Okay. Um, got to, I'm gonna try to jog your memory here. She said she first saw you on the Virginia Graham show. She goes, I am surprised, uh, her grandmother used to watch it, and her grandmother was watching it. You were on the show. She called Kathy in to watch it with her, and since that day, Kathy has been hooked on you and has just loved you ever since. She wants to know where she can find that clip. Is it even wow. exists anymore? Do you remember that experience? I used to go out of my way when Alice was the scourge of the planet. Um, I used to go out of way, my way to put Alice in places he didn't belong. Uh, Hollywood Squares. I mean, I, I did not belong on that show. Virginia Graham show was like, you know, like a mid-morning housewife show where they're ironing and going. It was like springtime for Hitler, you know. It was, uh... So, I loved doing shows like that where you just inject yourself into a place where you just did not belong. You know, that was more effective doing that than in rock and roll because in rock and roll, you sort of did belong, you were an outlaw, but you kind of expected the next outlaw to come out and the next villain or whoever it was. Never on the Virginia Graham show. That would be like so wrong to be on that, but good, it affected you. <laughs> and you turned out fine, apparently. Of course, Jury's out on that. <laughs> and uh, Paul, uh, another uh, question that came in for you a lot was your voice. Uh, you have maintained it so well, and people wanted to know is, what's your secret. You know. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Well, that's a very nice, nice question. Uh, I think, in a way, I'm blessed. You know, it, it is a gift, 
And when I was younger, I didn't really understand that, you know, but I, you know, like when you're young, you kind of abuse yourself a lot, a bit too much booze and all the rest of it, stuff like that. No, no, I don't, you, you know nothing about this. <laughs> when you grow up, you know. But um, yeah, but I mean, I, I did come to the conclusion that I'm, I've got to look after myself if, if my voice is gonna, you know, remain with me. And, and my voice is really who I am. It's what I do and everything. So I decided I would sort of um, take care of myself and be healthy. And that's the idea, I think. I have to be as healthy as I can all the time. So that's what I do. You know, when we did the, uh, the, the, the uh, thing, the rock and roll symphony, British symphony thing, thing. Yeah. we used to call him the voice. Oh no. Well, all the guys, they say, where's the voice? <laughs> We're at breakfast, they're going, where's the voice? He's, he's on his way. Because if you think of it, he's the most versatile. How many guys could join Queen? I mean, come on. You know, that's a very specific, that's a very specific kind of singing to be able to, to, to play in Queen and then yeah. also be in Bad Company and to be in, you know, blues rock and then go to this kind of almost operatic Rock. Yeah. You know. well, thanks, Alice. You know, in a way, it was a bit, in, in, my thinking was a little bit in the way that you were doing when you were putting yourself in places that you really didn't belong. When they first called me up and asked me, you know, would you like to do a couple of shows with us just for, the, just for fun, my first reaction was, oof. I don't know about that, you yeah, know. Yeah, Freddie Mercury's then, a hard act to follow. But then, you know, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I thought, but then I thought, well, heck, why not? You know, what a challenge that is, yeah. you know. So we did a couple of shows and it developed into, actually I stayed, we were together for four years. We went all around the world twice and we went to places I had never even dreamed, I didn't even know they existed, you know, places like uh, Latvia and stuff. I mean, I couldn't, point to that on the yeah. map, to be honest with you. Sure. But the president of Latvia came out, or the prime minister, and he played drums on All Right Now. <laughs> so, and, I, and thousands of people turned out. And I, and I said to Spike, the keyboard, I said, why don't we tell the folks back home, you know? And it was, uh, it was an incredible, exciting trip, actually, through, through all of those countries. And they're such good musicians. The they're guys, great. Brian they're, May is one of the Brian great, great guitar players. Yeah. You know, huh? yeah, he is. And they did fantastic versions of Feel Like Making Love, Wishing Well, All Right Now. Yeah. I mean, so it was a, you know, we shared our repertoire together. It was a lot of fun. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, and that was actually another question. Uh, well, how you came to do it, you told us that. But now, in hindsight, um, you were pleased with it. And actually, what do you, forget in hindsight, because you kind of did just mention that. What, did you, what do you think now about uh, Adam Lambert singing with them? I, you know, I haven't really checked it out, to be honest. When I, when I moved on, I sort of moved away from it. So I don't really know. I mean, I do wish, I wish them every success in what they do. Before I, I, we got together, they hadn't really toured since Freddie. They'd done the odd big gig with lots of different singers, but they hadn't actually been able to put a band together that could actually tour. Together, we did that. We actually, and they found out that they could, hey, they could do this thing, tour. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. gotta be frustrating for a band as good as Queen, when you lose your lead singer and you know you still want to tour, yeah. and you still have all those great songs. Yeah. It was like I, The Doors, the same thing with The Doors. With, absolutely. You know, losing yeah. Jim Morrison. Yeah. You've got guys that are viable, and they know, they have all these songs. Yeah. They just don't have the, the guy up front to do it. Yeah. You know? And you know, the fans the, the, were unbelievable. They, they, there was no question of, uh, oh, well, you're not Freddie, you can't be here. They were really happy to see the band with the final jigsaw piece in, in yeah. the play, you know, um, functioning and, and delivering these great songs. So, yeah. I'll tell you what, the first time I saw Adam Lambert on American Idol, and you're not, you're not gonna believe this, but I went, that guy should sing for Queen. Wow. I, I, because I said he's perfect for it. He's got the range, you know. He's got the look. Put it that way. And <laughs> what was that? I missed that. Yeah, the look. <laughs> the Not look. that there's anything wrong with it. <laughs> the look. The attitude. <laughs> and and then I heard him actually do a jam session with Queen, where he did "We Are the Champions" and "Bohemian Rhapsody," and it, he did it dead on. But he did it like Freddie. He didn't do it, he didn't do it like, when you would take the song and interpret it, the way you would do it. He did it like Freddie, and he did it pretty close. Yeah. So it really did work on that thing. But I was surprised that they, when they got him, I went, oh, that's for me. <laughs>
All right, Alice, back to you now. Um, you know, you're obviously your stage shows are very theatrical. Um, there was, this comes from, her name is Marsha Marion. She wants to know, have you ever thought of now taking your show and, I'm sorry, basing a Broadway show on your stage presentation? That seems to be a lot of artists are moving in that direction. I noticed this is something, if my memory is right, you look, actually looked into many, many years ago. Well, there's, there was talk of doing a, you know, a Broadway play and it had all this, you know, uh, the love story between Cheryl and I. We've been married 39 years and she started as a little 18 year old ballerina, you know. And you have a long marriage too, that's right. And, um, and they gave me this big story. And I said, guys, it's already written. It's called Welcome to My Nightmare. <laughs> the show was a Broadway show. I said, the songs are all there. It's already choreographed. It's written. We can update it. And, and then we, we take whatever songs are left and do an encore at the end for an hour, you know? But it's already written. Because Welcome to My Nightmare was basically a Broadway show. I mean, it was directed by, you know, uh, David Winters, who was in West Side Story, did the choreography on it. Um, everybody that worked on that show was from Broadway. So we were doing that in 1975, 76. The audience didn't know it was a Broadway show, but it was a full Broadway show. So I said, it's already written. All, you have to, all we have to do is adapt it to the stage. So it, you know, they'll probably wait till I die and then put it out, you know. <laughs> Adam Lambert will play me. <laughs> <laughs> or Ellen DeGeneres or something. <laughs> It's a risky proposition. I mean, it's, so many of them <clears throat> try it and, and fail. I mean, well, and you know, and you know, Sting's project, uh, The Last Ship. From what I understand, it was terrific. It just if you don't if you don't grab that that one thing that everybody wants to see, then I don't know if you're going to get that. And if it, you know, when I saw Tommy, when Tommy came out, it was a bit early because they had to water it down. You know, and they realized that most of the people that come to Broadway are from Iowa or Nebraska or somewhere, and they don't like all that loud music. Well, think of it. If you're 70 years old, you were a Rolling Stones fan. Now, yeah. you know, you're, you weren't a Sinatra fan. You were a Beatles Rolling Stones fan. So now you could get away with doing a, a Broadway show, a real Broadway show with real rock. You know, so now maybe it might be a better time to do that, you know. Yeah, we'll see Jersey Boys is the only one that has continued to yeah. survive. Uh, a Green Days thing did pretty well. It did pretty know. good for a while. Yeah. yeah, but it's not didn't didn't have that lasting thing. You know, you need something that you need a story there that's going to make people want to keep coming back. West Side Story was a love story. It was it was uh, Romeo and Juliet. Mm -hmm. You know, with gangs. That's really what it was. And Paul, one of the questions here for you. Um, this comes from Billy Jack Gann of El Rico, Florida. Strangest thing that's ever happened to you on stage, seeing as how you have performed solo for so many years and have been in so many bands, something must have happened somewhere along the line that you, that you felt was very moments. strange. Yeah, oh, anyway. Well, yeah. Mm. Actually, well, we talked about Queen earlier. We, one of the things we did together was the song Bad Company. We decided we were going to present this um, Queen style, I guess. So the piano was going to come up through the stage like this, you know, it would just appear in mist and smoke and lasers. And I would start playing it down below. And um, so while they were like moving the piano onto this piece of stage be below the stage, there was a great big hole in the stage. Everybody had express warnings, do not step off into the hole because it's like, it's, a, it's, it's very high, yeah. it's like, you know. And so I'm down there, I'm playing down, Dang. The smoke's going out. I can look up and I can see the arena and the lights and everything. And we're coming up. And I'm just starting. And I look up. And there is a guitarist on the end of the, 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 uh, the piano. It's Brian and he's, he's fallen down the hole. And, and he doesn't mind me telling this story. But, uh, but he, he, he landed, as all guitarists will, with his guitar neck protected so he wouldn't go out of tune. So he took the full brunt on his elbow and his hip and everything. So we're like, this is a hydraulic lift. Any limbs hanging over the edge will be clipped off when it reaches the stage level, you see. So they hit the emergency stop. All the roads jumped in to this, which was now like a six foot pit into the piano. 
And how do I, all the time I'm going, do I still keep playing or what? I do. <laughs> but he yanked him up, dusted him off, put him back in place, and up I came. And it was, it was, a, it was a very spinal tap moment. We all agreed. And uh, you know, it was, it was a lot of fun. It was great. <laughs> So those are the ones you remember. You'll forget 890%. Yeah. You remember that one forever. Yeah. And God knows you must have thousands of them too, I'm oh sure. Oh my gosh. Anytime you have anything, any moving object on stage, it's going to break. And you have to think on your feet. We decided that we were going to shoot Alice out of a cannon. Okay. Because we'd already killed Alice every way we could kill him, you know. And so we bought this giant cannon, big wooden cannon. And the trick was they put me in it. I would get out the side, they'd put the dummy in there, and the net was over there, and they'd shoot it across the stage, and then I would be standing. What could go wrong, right? <laughs> well, it worked every night. Yeah, rehearsal was great. First night, you see, you know, the mo troubles were playing like this, and it goes, <laughs> the dummy comes out about that much, and just... <laughs> At this moment, then you have to play it like Clouseau. You know, you have to just kind of pull the dummy out and kind of kick it aside, you know. It was supposed to happen. That was supposed to happen. Yeah. And the next day, we sold the cannon to the Rolling Stones. <laughs> and of the course, Mick straddled it, you know, and it was, there it was. You know, I don't know what he did with it, but I can imagine. You know, by the way, I was thinking about this, I don't know why I was thinking about this, but I know when you're done touring, a lot of the equipment goes in storage. There's a famous place in uh, Nashville and places out in Burbank that store all the musical equipment. Who, who watches the snake when you're not on the road? The snake, the, we have a different snake every show, every, every tour. Oh. So every, every, the snake gets retired, goes to a petting zoo or an Indiana Jones movie, you know. Um, <laughs> The, the, the funniest snake story of all time. It's not, it wasn't funny for the snake, but it was the weirdest thing that ever happened. You know, it's, it's a snake, it's a, you know, we, it, it traveled first class. It ate mink, you know, I mean, the snake was treated better than anybody in the band. And so we had a, you know, a, a case about the size of that monitor right there, and it has a heating pad in it, and this, you know, living the life of luxury, you know. So a couple of rats in there and boom, gone. The next morning I open it up and there's the snake and there's a cord coming out of his mouth connected to, he ate the heating pad. <laughs> and I went, wait a minute. How could he eat, there was blood from the, you know, and they are very poor eyesight and they can't hear, and it was on the corner of the heating pad. So the corner of the heating pad got in his mouth, and, he, and they, they constrict, swallowed the whole thing, so there's just the cords coming out of his mouth, plugged into the wall. <laughs> and I for once in my life, I went, <laughs> what? Because <laughs> I said, how, what, he could, and so we called up the vet, you know, I said, and I explained it to him, and he goes, yeah, right. I said, no, really. And he says, well, unplug the plug. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he says, don't try to pull it out because it'll pull his stomach out. You know, he says, cut the wire and he should be able to digest it. You know, because they, their acids can digest anything, you know. Yeah, anything. And so, when bones, I mean, when they eat something, they just digest it. The acid just digests well, after two days, we noticed a little blood coming out of his nose. So we took him to the hospital, and they opened him up, put him to sleep, opened him up, took the heating pad out, sewed him back up, and he's in a petting zoo now, doing fine. Yes. But Jay Leno had the joke that night. He says, you know you're too old to rock when your snake swallows your heating pad. <laughs> Which I thought was very clever. You know. Uh, and Paul and his wife Cynthia are their patrons of the Willows Animal Sanctuary in the yep. UK. So, uh... I think, though, we talked one time, didn't we, about the horses? 
Well, yeah. Um, they, on, on the radio, we talked about this, uh, the uh, racehorses. Uh, yes. Yeah. Well, they, they take in every kind of animal there, they, from horses to stick insects, you know, from pet rabbits to... There was actually one story about um, a pig that was on the way... Little piglets that were on the way to the slaughterhouse, actually. And this little one actually jumped out of the wagon and fell right outside their door. They've got a long driveway, and they found it running around. It was a little bit injured. Um, and they fixed it up. I mean, of all the luck in the world, on the way to the slaughterhouse, it jumped down right in front of this, the only place that would rescue it. And that's a Disney movie. That's a, it is. Or a Budweiser commercial, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a good one. But, I mean, it, it started out this little tiny pig and it ended up being 600 pound porker, you know. And, um, but, but they're really wonderful up there and they struggle. I mean, all, all these places they struggle. We, we picked up on it, Cynthia and I, and, and we just kind of, our heart went out to them because they, they, they so struggled to, to make ends meet and make things work. And so we decided we'd just we'd help them out. And uh, we do that, we, it's, it's nice. That's great, it's, it's, cool. and by the way, I never killed a chicken, okay? <laughs> well, you know. Colonel Sanders killed billions of them, but yeah. I never killed one. He's got a lot to answer for yeah. anyway. Well, for a long time, that was like, that happened on stage. I threw it in the audience, the audience tore it to pieces. And, oh, God, and, really? and I thought they would take it home as a pet, yeah. you know. Oh. But the odd thing was the first five rows were all in wheelchairs. Wow. So they were the ones that killed the chicken, and wow. the next day in the paper, I, I killed the chicken, and now I was this geek that killed chickens, wow. um, but never did kill chickens. And I'm an extreme animal. Yeah, I see. Lover. Yeah, so am I. I mean, the thing is, I, mean, I, I eat animals. I'm, an, I'm a meat eater. I'm, I'm a carnivore. I don't deny it. That's who I am. But and a lot of people are too. But the thing is, I don't think we have to be cruel to them. You know what I mean? It's true. It's like we, we originally were hunter gatherers and we would chase animals and hunt them down and kill them and eat them. And that's the name of the game. Yeah. But at least um, they would have had some sort of life. And I don't think there's any need to be cruel. I, I just don't like that. I think there's a lot of corporate that when it goes to corporate, it gets very. Yeah. Very, it's, they're, yeah. Not, they're not considered animals, they're just considered. You know, product. Exactly. Which is not, you know, yeah. that's, that's what kind of gets you when you see that. You yeah, know? yeah, absolutely. My daughter, my my daughter uh, Calico, rescues Chihuahuas, and she has the strangest menagerie of these rescue dogs. She has one that has one eye, an underbite like that, <laughs> bow legged, half of a tail, and it's got like a patchy. We call him Captain Jack. He looks like a pirate. You know. <laughs> The sweetest little dog in the world, yeah. you know. But, I mean, if you are going to go get a dog, if you're going to go get, buy a puppy or something, go to the animal shelter. Yes. There's so many great animals. And these dogs nice are so lovable, especially the mutts. Yeah. You know, yeah. I've always been really partial to the real, just, you know, just the mutt that's the, you know. <laughs> that's usually your dog forever. And I have yeah. a saying at the end of my radio show, be the person your dog thinks you are. Yeah. Think of it. Your dog yeah, you thinks know. you're the greatest thing on the planet. Yeah. If you could be that person, you'd be the greatest person in the world. Yeah. Good point. Does the sanctuary take in snakes that eat heating pads? I'm sure they do, actually. Does this, the heating pad still work, I was going to ask you. Are you checking? <laughs> and uh, speaking of uh, good deeds, Alice, every uh, December... Uh, you hold your Christmas pudding benefit there in the Phoenix area, yeah. which raises money for your Solid Rock Foundation, which encourage, encourages kids to get involved with the arts in their community. Uh, you just had another one this past December with Johnny Lang, Nils Lofgren, Joel and Turner. How yeah. involved are you on that oh, on I'm, the 11 other months of the year? Takes all, that takes a good part of my year. Um, just go through the Rolodex and say, oh, by the way, what are you doing next December? <laughs> <laughs> We, what I do is I, I try to go through and put like 10 major acts and we make it a Christmas party. It's sort of like everybody gets up at a party and does two or three songs, you know? And, and I try to put people together that don't belong together. Like Rob Zombie and Pat Boone, you know? <laughs> Amy Grant and Dee Snyder. You know, I try to get people that shouldn't be together, but it's Christmas so they can sing together. Uh, and then we just have our, I have my band up there and everybody just kind of plugs into my band and it's fun. But what it is, is I noticed, um, we put together Solid Rock Foundation, it's a Christian nonprofit. And I noticed, I said, I saw these two 16-year-old kids on the corner, and I'm from Detroit, I've seen a drug deal go down before. 
and I'm watching them pass this and getting that and the envelope and the whole thing. And I went, how does this kid know he might not be the best guitar player in Arizona? Or he might be the best drummer? He's never had that opportunity. He's never had that, because his life is blueprinted this way. So what if you gave him the, that option? So we opened this thing called Solid Rock Foundation where you can come in, it's not really a foundation, it's a, it's a music school. And you can play guitar, bass, drums, everything free. Everything's free. Fender gave us all the guitars we wanted. Fender gave us all the drums, everything. Sure gave us the mics. And we get 50 to 100 kids a week in there. And I'm telling you, some of these kids were on their way to either dead or prison, because you're going to be in a gang on the west side, and you're going to end up in that situation. Some of these kids now are pretty good guitar players, That's pretty awesome. good drummers. That is awesome. But it's a fun thing. Every city needs 10 of these. Yeah. But this is just the only one that we put together, and I'm hands-on. You know, my wife teaches dance there. My son teaches guitar there. And and it's so, I call it the glorious racket. Because there's like five guitar rooms, four drum rooms, yeah. and, you know, and you go in and it's just great noise. Because these kids are in there playing their hardest, trying to, yeah. trying to play a bad company song, That's trying fantastic. to play, a, you know, yeah. the smoke on the what water. Or this. And then every once in a while you go, what was that? And you go in a room and you go, wow, this kid can play. Yeah. You know, and that kid's, his life has changed now. You change one kid's life in the ghetto, and you change the neighborhood. You don't just change the kid. The neighborhood looks at him and goes, wow. He didn't have to sell drugs to get there. Yes. You know? Yes. And I mean, we, 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 honestly, that's the commodity, and that's how some people have to live, mm -hmm. you know, to, to get by. Yeah. But you got to give them an alternative. Yeah, beautiful thing. Yeah. And you mentioned your son, and both of you uh, have children who have uh, following in your musical footsteps. Paul, your son Steve is here. He'll be opening for you tonight. That yeah. must be quite a feeling. Uh, it's a great. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, he's. I, you know, I'm totally biased, of course, but I think he's. Um, even when I stand aside and look at him from a distance, I think he's very uh, original and um, very creative. So I'm very proud of him, indeed. Yeah, that's great. Same as him. And your son Dash has a band who you actually sat in with uh, oh, yeah. last year. Uh, These kids started when they were in kindergarten. They all went to Sunday school together. They played little league together. They played everything, and now they all teach at Solid Rock. But their band is darn good. I mean, they're a really good little hard rock band. And and I made sure they were a hard rock band. <laughs> <laughs> so they don't want to hear any any of this other. I want to hear hard rock. And you know, he grew up listening to the Beatles, the Beach Boys, and the Four Seasons, and then he grew up into other harder rock. But it's great to hear them and actually sit there and go objectively, not bad. You know, not bad. So it's, it's fun to get up and, they know four or five of my songs, I get up and do songs with them, and they're, they're good. Yeah. Well, that's great, you must be very proud. And uh, as we start to wind down here, what's on tap for the year for you, Mr. Rogers? Uh, I understand uh, you'll be uh, doing some shows along the way. Any recordings in the in the planning stages as well? I uh, I have a lot of material that I've been um, that I've recorded with the producer on the Royal Sessions, Perry Mogul. We we're sitting on those right now, and we plan to put something together with those. Um, and well, there's a lot actually. We recorded um, and filmed the Albert Hall, where, where we played a show there. So we'll be working on that. And I'm doing shows throughout the year. I do, I actually sort of limit my shows. I don't want to do sort of a, a zillion shows every year because it gets, I think it gets, you can lose energy a little bit. So I like to every show to have a real impact and real power and real freshness. So I, I sort of do 10 or 20 shows a year actually. And uh, this past July was, uh, well, in uh, 2013 was the 40th anniversary of Bad Company, you did a tour. Yep. Uh, 2014 was the 40th anniversary of your first U.S. show. Any Bad Company plans on the horizon? That uh, always seems to bubble under. Well, uh, yeah, they, they, they're always bubbling under. They're, they, they, right now, um, Atlantic Records are putting together a, a, one of those things where they get all of the tapes that we ever did and they stick them on a CD and put them out, basically. But we're, we're kind of fine-tuning that a little bit because I don't think you want to put everything you ever did out on, on CD. But um, they will make a vinyl copy of this, and uh, that's going to be coming out, too. 
I, I listened to a lot of the tracks and there's some, I was quite surprised actually, there's a couple of tracks that I don't even know why we didn't put them on the album. But the, oh, maybe there just wasn't space. So there are a couple of gems in there, there are different kind of arrangements, so that'll be out. Great. Yeah. And uh, Alice, um, radio show still going strong? Yeah, doing that. I'm, I'm on two tours right now. I'm on the yeah. Motley tour. They're, we're doing the Motley Crew tour. We've done 75 shows with them and 30 more coming up in the States and Australia with them. And then we're doing our own tour right. at the same time. So oh, it's strong. like, yeah, <laughs> it's like over a, I think we did 175 shows last year or something wow. like that. And, uh, but you know, I you know, it's it's I enjoy doing that. It's it's yeah. fun. I, I have fun. My band is the uh, my band are all best of friends, yeah. and it's you can tell on stage there we have more fun than the audience does. I think on stage, so uh, it's it's always fun to play with these guys. And, and, and honestly, since I was 16, that's all I've done is been on stage. So that I feel more comfortable on stage than off stage. I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah. Well, or, or the golf course. And the golf course, well, you yes. got, got a lot of golf questions. You have to have you some advice, you know. There was a, yeah, there was a, like I said, a lot of golf questions. Uh, uh, did you ever get a hole in one? I have four. Four, okay. Where, do you remember where the first one was, or did you buy drinks for everybody? Yes, I did. It was on a Saturday in Maui, where, where a beer was $12. <laughs> My first hole in one cost me about $2,500. And I was glad to pay it, because it was a hole in one. But I've had four hole-in-ones, three double eagles, which is even more rare than a hole-in-one. Um, but I play six days a week, so I always tell people I don't play better than anybody, I play more than anybody. But it's, again, I've got a very addictive personality. When I was, when I was drinking and doing drugs, I did it every day, yeah. you know, so. <laughs> yeah, right. So when I quit, I totally quit, and I had to find another addiction. Well, rock and roll's an addiction for me, and so was golf. So I played golf in the morning, rock and roll at night. The two never meet. You know, Alice Cooper would hate golf. I mean, Alice hates anything like that. And yet, when I'm on the course, I never think about him. When I'm playing Alice, I never think about golf. So it's a, it's a great, you know, it's a great balance act, yeah. Yeah, I meant to ask you that actually when, when you first sat down. When uh, I've interviewed Ozzy Osbourne, I ask him, who am I speaking to? Am I speaking to John Osbourne or to Ozzy? He goes, you're speaking to John. So am I I'm actually speaking to Vincent this whole hour? No, I, you know, I'm, I'm Alice, you know. But it's just that I'm not that Alice. I don't even hang out with that Alice, you know. Uh, when you create a character, and all of us do. I mean, Paul it looks very tame here, right? No. I do. When you get on stage, when you get on stage, everybody, you get this adrenaline fix, and you get this audience fix, and you can't explain this to anybody that hasn't been up there, yeah. but you suddenly are a different person. Yeah. You're a, you're a, a you know, it, I can't explain it, you're another creature. And when you get off stage, you're not that guy anymore. It's true. You leave that guy up there. I say that Jim Morrison died, Jimi Hendrix died, Janis Joplin died trying to be that all the time. They brought that character off stage and you can't do that. You have to leave him up there. Yeah. So I've, you know, when, when, I, when the curtain comes down, I'm not Alice anymore. But I can't wait to play him at night. It's fun to play him at night. Because I'm not a villain, he is, you know. Well, I, I think... Uh, I think that's a, gr a great way to, to uh, bring this to a conclusion. The fact that you, uh, we are blessed that you are both still here and did not check out at 27 years yeah. old. We thank you both. Oh, that's true. Eh? <laughs> uh, and uh, both of you uh, will be performing again today, so check them out. Actually, today's a day where you can see them where they don't really conflict with each other. So uh, yeah. Oh, it's, it's always a pleasure. Paul Rogers, Alice Cooper. Thank, thank you both. You guys.